Rome's gladiators evoke images of slaves taken from across the empire, ill-treated and trained as gladiators to entertain the public, of two combatants entering the arena and only one leaving. But the truth is that this image was forged by Hollywood, and this simple portrayal was not always true to history. The origins of gladiators is unknown, with even the ancient historians in disagreement. In accordance to Nicholas of Damascus, writing in the late 1st century BC, gladiators were of Etruscan origin, but a generation later, the historian Livy wrote that they were first held by the Campanians in 310 BC to celebrate their victory over the Samnites. Modern archaeology suggests that gladiators were of Campanian origin as tomb frescoes from the city of Praestrum show paired fighters clad as gladiators, but even these frescoes may simply show a continuation of a much earlier tradition, possibly inherited from Greek colonists of the 8th century. The first Roman gladiatorial contest was in 264 BC, when Rome was fighting the first Punic War with Carthage. Livy recorded that Decimus Julius Brutus had three pairs of gladiators fight to the death. The actual words used were munus gladiatorium, munus meaning duty or obligation of honour. In this case, the gladiators were to honour Brutus's father. In 216 BC, the consul Marcus Aemilius Lepidus was honoured by his sons with three days of gladiatorial contests in the Forum, using 22 pairs of gladiators. Ten years later, Scipio Africanus gave a commemorative monus for his uncle and father who were killed during the Punic Wars. The next recorded monus was in 183 BC and held for the funeral of Publius Licinius. This spectacle was extravagant and involved three days of funeral games. 120 gladiators were involved and meat was distributed to the public. In 105 BC, Rome's first state-sponsored games involving gladiators were held. It proved immensely popular and thereafter, gladiator contests were often included in state games that accompanied major religious festivals. Gladiators became big business and a tool for the politically ambitious. Politicians would sponsor games to win the support of the plebeian class. The trade in gladiators was empire-wide and Rome's military successes produced a supply of prisoners taken in war. But the ranks of gladiators were not just filled by prisoners of war, but by criminals and most surprising of all, free men. Gladiators were trained in specialist schools called the Ludus. Those condemned to the Ludus were most likely branded or marked with a tattoo on the face, legs or hands. But three men joining were able to negotiate a contract which stipulated how often they were to perform, their fighting style and earnings. All gladiators, volunteered or condemned, were bound to service by sacred oath. He vows to endure to be burned, to be bound, to be beaten, and to be killed by the sword. The Gladiator's Oath In charge of the Ludus was the Lanista, who oversaw training and ultimately had the power of life and death over the gladiators. Tutoring the gladiators was a doctor, but not a doctor in the sense that we think a doctor at Eludus was an expert in a particular fighting style, such as a Bistarius who fought against animals, Hoplumachus, a Greek style fighter, a Retarius who fought with trident and net, or a Mormillo who was heavily armed with a shield and gladius. There were many different types of gladiators, even women called gladiatrix. Life in the Ludus was harsh with strict rules and training regimes, but gladiators 
were a substantial investment for the Lenista and were otherwise well fed and cared for. Their diet was vegetarian, consisting of barley, boiled beans, oats and dried fruits. Also, gladiators would regularly be massaged and receive high quality medical care. In 73 BC, a group of gladiators from Aludus in Capua, owned by Lentullius Batiatus, fought their way free. Once free, the escaped gladiators chose their leaders, selecting two Gallic slaves, Crixus and Onomaeus, and one Thracian that once served in the Roman auxiliary, Spartacus. This band of gladiators easily defeated the small Roman forces sent to recapture them, and soon slaves from all over Italy flocked to join them, swelling their numbers to around 120,000 men, women and children. The Roman Senate grew increasingly alarmed by the slave rebellion and mustered eight legions under the command of Marcus Licinius Crassus. After long and bitter fighting, Crassus defeated the slave army at the Battle of Silurus River in 71 BC. Some 6,000 slaves survived the battle and Crassus ordered them crucified along the Appian Way. After this revolt, there was tighter controls kept over gladiators. A gladiator could expect to fight around three times a year, though it could be more. Games were advertised well beforehand on billboards that gave reason for the games, its editor, venue, date and number of pair gladiators to be used. There were many amphitheatres all over the Roman Empire, ranging in size but the one we are most familiar with is the Colosseum in Rome. Despite what you might see in the movies, there was a strict seating arrangement for those attending the games. The emperor had his own box and the seats closest to the action were for the higher classes of Roman society. Further back were the plebs, the lower class citizens, then right at the back were the women. Like in modern sports today, there were rivalries between towns. In 59 AD, there was a serious riot and bloodshed at the amphitheatre in Pompeii. It had begun with the Pompeians and Eucerians shouting insults and throwing stones at each other. Things quickly escalated and violence poured out into the streets, which led the Roman Senate to send the Praetorian Guard to restore order and to ban Pompeii from further games for a period of 10 years. Contrary to popular belief, not all gladiators who lost their bouts were killed. The top gladiators were extremely popular with the people and extraordinarily expensive. One such gladiator was called Flamma, who won his freedom and was awarded with a wooden sword called a Rudus. Flamma, however, chose to remain a gladiator. Flamma was 30 when he died, and his tomb reads that he fought 34 times, winning 21, drawing 9 times, and losing 4. A gladiator acknowledged his defeat by raising a finger in appeal to the referee to stop the combat, and refer to the editor, whom would make his decision based upon the crowd's response. The editor signalled his decision by police verso, meaning with a turned form. This description is too imprecise for reconstructions of the gesture, though Hollywood movies have interpreted it as the thumbs down gesture. The fact is that gladiator bouts were far more professional than we think, with a considerable degree of stagecraft. Gladiators were expected to observe the rules of combat, which were enforced by a senior referee. Music was played to build tension and heighten the dramatic swordplay. A gladiator who was refused the missio was dispatched by his opponent. Gladiators were trained for a good death, to die well, never asking for mercy, nor to cry out. A defeated gladiator would kneel before his opponent, who would then stab him through the neck. The body of a gladiator was removed from the arena with dignity and taken to the morgue where it was stripped of armour. Then the body would be cleaned and dressed for burial. 
Gladiators could become members of a collegia, a union as we'd call it today, which would ensure a proper burial and sometimes a pension for the wives and children. The popularity of gladiators began its decline with the rise of Christianity. In the early 3rd century AD, the Christian writer Tertullian condemned the attendance of Christians from the games, saying that they were spiritually and morally harmful. In 325 AD, Constantine the Great banned criminals from being forced to fight to the death as gladiators. Then, Theodosius I adopted Christianity as the state religion of the Roman Empire in 393 AD and banned all pagan festivals. Gladiators offered spectators an example of Rome's martial ethics and, in fighting and dying well, they could inspire admiration and popular acclaim. They were celebrated in art and their value as entertainers was commemorated in precious and commonplace objects throughout the Roman world. 